Good evening, everybody. I'm excited tonight to start our Devo out. Um, we're going to be talking about 1 John 3 and chapter 2 as our uh, verse that we're, we built this Devo around. Before we get to that, though, I want to go back and talk about our verse of the year. The elders have chosen for us to spend time dwelling on and thinking about Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, which reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. We live in a crazy time, um, but I don't think that's unusual. I think looking back in history, things are always crazy. There's always something going on in the world that's crazy. Whether it be a world war, maybe it's a, a civil war, or some sort of pandemic like we're seeing now with COVID-19. Um, this year seems like it's crazier than normal um, because of COVID-19. It's not COVID-19, it's the riots or the wildfires or the hurricanes. And there's just all kinds of things going on in the world right now. And I think we feel this harder than normal because we're having to be a little more separate, because we're having to do things like this instead of meeting in person. And I think that adds a, a lot of stress to us. I don't think it's good for us um, as people to be too isolated. But it's okay. But it's going to be okay. That's the thing that we have to remember, is all of this is going to pass. It's going to get behind us. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. We have a good God who's going to take care of us. No matter what's going on in the world. No matter how it affects us. Our God is always going to be there. He has a plan for us. We should have hope. We should know that no matter what happens, at the end of all things here, I have the hope of going to heaven. And there it's going to be a beautiful place. There will not be any of the stresses that we have in this earth. That's exciting. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a good verse for us to spend a lot of time on. So as we go into this, Devo, keep that, keep that on your mind. Let's look at 1 John 3. <clears throat> Let's read verse, we'll start with verse 2 and then we'll read through verse 6. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We are God's children now. As Christians, we know that we are God's children, that we are his, we belong to him. That's so exciting. That's so exciting to know that there's more than just me by myself, that no, I'm a child of God, and he has plans for us. I can have hope in that. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Heaven isn't here. Uh, we sing a song, uh, this world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. But one day I'm going to go to heaven. And that's so exciting. We will see him as he is. You know, on earth now we can see who our God is and the powers that he has. He has shown himself to us through the beauty of the world, through the stars and the mountains, through our own physical bodies and how we function, how everything's made to work. We see our God. But one day we will sit at the foot of the throne and worship him. That's such a beautiful thing. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So everyone who hopes in him. Verse 4 says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. For you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. In him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. So back to verse 3. If we hope in him, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Having hope, having that hope, knowing that 
our God has provided a plan for us. That's us believing in him, believing in his plan, believing that he's going to take care of us. We have that hope. But everyone who practices lawlessness and keeps on sinning, verse 6 says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. We have to turn away from sin if we are to be Christ's children. We have to put it behind us. Uh, verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. There was no sin in Christ. If we are going to be Christians, then we need to get rid of the sin in our lives. Whatever it may be, however we have to do it, we need to get it gone. We must get it gone. If we're going to be close to God, if we're going to have that hope of eternity one day with him, we must get the sin out of our lives. Whatever it takes, that's what we need to do. If you'll turn over with me to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. And keep thinking about the hope that we have. Revelation 22, starting in verse 1 uh, through verse 7. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the trees, for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord of God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits, the, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servant what, what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. One day, we will get to go there and see the river and to be at peace. Everything about that picture is just a beautiful, tranquil, um, just a peaceful place, it sounds like. I want to go there where we can be God's servants and we will worship him. We will see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. That we won't need a light because God will be our light and there will be no darkness. In verse 7 it says, And behold, I am coming soon. I'm not worried about the world and the things that are happening today because I have a hope of heaven one day. One day, all of this is going to be behind me. There's no need for me to stress and worry about the things going on in the world, the things on the news, the whatever it may be. Today, I can just love my neighbor. I can love my family. I can provide for those around me. As best as I can, I can live at peace with all men. I don't need to stress about all those things because one day, there's heaven. One day, all of the things that are bad will be gone. One day, there will be no darkness. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. We must put sin out of our life. We must be true Christians, and we must hold on to the hope that we have. Please keep all this in mind as we go through the Devo tonight. Please remember who our God is, and remember the hope that we have. Thanks, everybody. Glad to be with you today to share a portion of God's Word for us to study together. Uh, we'll be seeing two texts, Romans 8, 14 through 29, and later second, from 2 second Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, both of these texts have to do with the future and hope that God has for us. Let us read Romans 8, 14 through 29. For as many as are led by the Son, Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to, the, to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So commenting on this text, we see it talks about being led by the Spirit. We understand we are led by the Spirit when we follow God's revealed will, which was revealed by the Holy Spirit, which we have written here in the New Testament. And it speaks earlier in this chapter about being led by the Spirit or living according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Also speaks here of being adopted. So we understand we are, it says we are children of God and that, that we are also heirs. Now it says if we suffer with him. So we understand it is important to, to suffer with Christ to partake in his sufferings, and in that way we can, if we suffer, we can have the good result of being glorified with him also. And it says the sufferings of this life are not to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. But then later on it speaks about, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Although we understand in this life uh, there can be up and down, ups and downs, and with it we will suffer as Christians for his cause, all things work together for good. Uh, and the suffering we might have, we, the joys we may have in this life, at the end, it will work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called. The called are the ones who have answered the gospel call, who have accepted the gospel message. And those who love God, loving God should also be a purpose of following God and having believed in him, having obeyed his gospel message. But God promises that all things will work together for good. The next passage is in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 18. It says, now that we are sufficient, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. We also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Though the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So we see here that we are not sufficient of ourselves to be ministers. Uh, Paul may be referring specifically to the apostles, but all of us have our sufficiency from God. Without God, we are nothing. And we are instruments from, for him because he has made, us, made that possible. It speaks of being ministers of the new covenant. And here there's a contrast between the new covenant and the old covenant, which was through Moses. Uh, and it speaks of how 
this old covenant is passing away. In verse 11, for what if, if what is passing away is glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So there's a comparison showing that now we are under covenant that gives life, which gives us freedom from sins. And it speaks of the time that Moses was up on the mountain and he came down and put a veil on his face because his face was so bright. And we can understand that they could not see his face clearly. In the same way, they could not see the full purpose of God. They could not see all of his purposes for man at that time. But now we have the veil taken away. Now we are no longer under that old covenant. It says that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ in, in John chapter 1. So now we have a fuller revelation. We understand better what God's purpose is and plans are for us, as it speaks of in Jeremiah 29. And, and here it under, makes us understand that also, helps us to understand. When we see in verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When we are converted to Christ, or, or here speaking of the Israelites, the veil of the Old Testament was taken away. They could see more clearly the plans of God. And we also, in our hearts, we need to take away those veils, things that may keep us from seeing the total will of God, the total purposes and plans that he has for us, which are glorious. And it speaks in verse 18 of seeing the glory of the Lord. And how about when we see, understand more about Christ, understand who he is, what his purposes are, as we see revealed in the New Testament, we ourselves become transformed. It speaks in Romans 12, verse 1, verses 1 through 2, how we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is a change, and, and it's a process that we can keep being changed when we understand more about God's plan, more about God's purposes. And it speaks of, in First John 3, verses 2, and other verses there, that when we see Christ, we will be more like him. So the more we understand about Christ and his will, the more we see how he was in, in his example, the more we understand about his teachings and, and what was also left by the apostles and prophets, the more we can understand what God really wants for us and what he wants us to do. And that's a glorious, uh, glorious thing for us. Thank you. Good evening. Tonight we will be reading Psalms 17, 1 through 15. Psalms 17, 1 through 15. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From your presence let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. With regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your path. My feet have not slipped. I will call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wonderfully show your steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who does me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity, with their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion, eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. From men by your hand, O Lord, from the men whose protection is in his life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children, and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Let's read Colossians 3, verses 1 through 15 together. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 15. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are ab above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, 
passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these too you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge, after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all, these put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Our closing thoughts will be together in prayer. If you will, please bow. God, our Creator, we exalt you and we thank you for being our refuge. Our refuge from evil, from our adversaries who wish to cause us harm. Just like David, you know our hearts, our thoughts, and our intentions. Lord, keep us on the path, the path that will ultimately unite us with you in heaven. God, you give us hope. You have shown us a little glimpse of what heaven will be like. It is truly hard to imagine just how wonderful it will be. We have a hope that if we put off the old man and are buried with Christ, remain faithful, we will see you face to face someday. Help us to put our focus on making it to heaven and bringing others with us. It is through the sacrifice of Jesus that this is possible. Lord, help us to put away anger, wrath, malice, and slander, and obscene talk. Lord, help us to grow in compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Above all, let us love others as Jesus loves us. God, it's through that love that we are able to share the gospel, your plan for all. Lord, bind us together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we know sometimes the devil tries to create strife and divide your family. Help us to be one. Forgive as you have help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. Lord, we ask Christ to dwell in our hearts. Help us to be united as one body, one heart, one soul, in perfect harmony for your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.